straight famous, straight famous. The year is 1997, an aspiring rap artist has been found hit up multiple times and deleted in the old manner at the age of 20. Rumor in the streets was that he was at odds with his then Straight record label at the time, famous. Cash Money Records. This is the story of Blood Money Records. Robert L. Johnson Jr., born August 28, 1976, was raised by his mother in the cutoff section of Algiers. As a kid, because of his large statue, he was nicknamed Big Rob. Rob would go on to play football at L.B. Landry High School on the West Bank. While still in the high school, Rob would embark on a rap career, hooking up with the newly started Cash Money Records, and on to become their first signee. Rob would won with the moniker Kilo G, a name he heard drop by Easy e on the Boys in the Hood track. Rob would record his debut album, Sleepwalker in 1992 on Cash Money Records when he was only 15 years old. Although Bounce was growing up as the new sound in New Orleans, the song would be more along the lines of West Bank hardcore rappers like Lord Level Organization, The Ruthless Juveniles, and Scarface from Houston. At the time, Willie D, Scarface's former label mate and partner from the group The Ghetto Boys, who had recently gone solo, would even stop by to see Kilo G as he recorded his album with producers Rogue and Goldfingers. Unfortunately for Cash Money and Kilo G, the first album would only sell a few thousand copies, which was not bad for an unknown, unproven rapper whose distribution was limited to selling CDs out of his trunk. Although not bad, it was nowhere near the success that Kilo G and Cash Money owner Brian Baby Williams and Ronald Sugar Slim had hoped for. Shortly after Kilo G's first release, Cash Money Records would team up with Genius producer DJ Manny Fresh, who would go on to produce every Cash Money release until his departure in 2005. Lamar's ranks started to grow, and after appearances on Mr. Ivan's and PNW's debut, as well as a Manny Fresh produced for a track tape, Kilo G would release this bloody city in 1995 on Cash Money Records, featuring guest appearances by UGK's Bun B and Pimp C, as well as new Cash Money artists Lil Slim, Miss T, and Tech 9. The album would be a massive improvement due to both Manny Fresh's expert production and Kilo G's vastly improved songwriting and performance. Despite the title and get the lyrics, the songs on the album will be far more in touch with reality. Yeah. On the song Coasting, Kilo G raps about his son and parents. Rob will come off as reflective and mature for being only 18 years old. The following year, Kilo G would appear on releases by his label mates Miss T and UNLV. With his growth as a rapper and Manny Fresh's groundbreaking production, a follow-up would have conceivably been his best yet. However, on the 15th of January in 1997, Kilo G will be deleted. Rob would be 20 years old at the time, even behind his girlfriend Lakeisha and their son Robert Johnson III. Birdman, The Big Timers, Juvenile, Manny Fresh, BG, Turk, and most famously, Lil Wayne, all names that jump out when New Orleans Cash Money records is mentioned. Birdman, aka Baby, and his brother Slim would create a huge movement in the 90s with Cash Money Records, and in terms of rap music, be one of the labels to put New Orleans on the map. Founded by Jean Baptiste and Dave Bienville in 1718 as La Nouvelle New Orleans, known worldwide for its French Quarter, New Orleans is a beautiful city with a rich history and a wide mix of cultures all residing and colliding in one place. As the birthplace of jazz, the city attracts millions of tourists each year for Mardi Gras, the never-ending party. Not to go without mention, New Orleans also has one of the most poverty-stricken ghettos in America. The Magnolia Projects, one of the largest important housing projects in New Orleans, was built in 1941. In 1955, the complex expanded and incorporated an additional six city blocks, creating the old side, new side. From 1952 to 1978, under manager Cleveland Joseph Pete, the project was officially name the C.J. Pete housing development, but to this day it is still known as the Magnolia Projects. As with other projects, conditions deteriorated during the 80s and 90s as that hard storm the city and crime skyrocketed. Throughout the early to mid 90s, New Orleans would have so many crushings that it would be coined the crushing capital of the United States. The Magnolia Projects were also where the Williams brother, Baby and Slim, would rep the streets to the fullest. Coming up in the hood wasn't pretty, but they would make a life for themselves and their families, along with countless others with their music label, Cash 
Money Records. Ronald, a.k.a. Slim, was born May 23rd, 1964. Brian, a.k.a. Baby, was born February the 15th of 1969. Their parents were Gladys Brooks and Johnny Williams, an ex-military man and an owner of multiple businesses, including a bar, a laundromat in New Orleans. Gladys Bar will become a popular hangout to hustlers, steppers, pimps, as well as working class individuals. The family will live in a small apartment above the bar. This story can't be told without mentioning how Brian Williams got the nickname Baby. A month after Brian's birth, he didn't have a first name. It was simply referred to as Baby. The nickname would stick with him for life until he became known nationally as the hip-hop artist Birdman. In 1975, Miss Gladys would pass from an illness. Baby and his siblings would spend two years living with their uncle and Prince George. While about two years in foster care upon their return to New Orleans, Johnny would later find out they were in foster care to fight a long battle, eventually gaining full custody of his children. Johnny would eventually move his family and newfound love of his life to Valley Street in the 13th Ward. Baby would develop a close friendship with his stepbrother, Eldrick Wise. Eldrick, a street dude, would run a baby on the streets, both engulfed in the game, moving as hustlers. The lore of the streets would be too strong to pass up for the youngsters. Seeing the dope boys' fits and jewelry of the hustlers who would frequent the family bar would provoke them to want even more. Eldrick would ultimately end up losing his life to the streets. Baby would go on to adapt to his environment where hustling became his thing. With moving that work came big money, which would lead to hood credibility and notoriety. Before Eldrick's passing, Baby and Eldrick would pull off acts, eventually moving weight at a young age. They would ultimately be arrested for possession and sentenced to Hunt's Correctional Center in St. Gabriel, Louisiana. After serving 18 months of the sentence, Baby would be released. Slim, who had always been known as a quiet, laid-back one, but have a mind for business that he inherited from Mr. Johnny at a young age. Meshing with Slim's hungry mind for business, Baby would have keen, hustling instincts. At a young age, they would put in work in their pursuit of wealth and independence. It was this attitude that had been driven into them by their father. Work hard, get your shit straight, and then you can play. As hip-hop exploded across the United States in the 80s, different regions would adopt certain elements and styles of music depending on the local culture. Miami would have the big bass, East Coast would have break beats with a hard edge, and the West Coast would have a laid-back G-Funk oriented sound. Meanwhile, in the Deep South, in New Orleans, a sound a style called bounce music would capture the attention of the locals. Artists like Kevin Ventry, MCT Tucker, DJ Jubilee, DJ Jimmy, Partners in Crime, Hotball Rhino, Juvenile, UNLV, just to name a few, would be among the first to make hip hop with a unique New Orleans flavor. Bounce music was a call and response party style of hip hop that involved dance call outs. The name for this style of music was peep pop music. A big part of Bounce is shouting out or acknowledging the hoods and housing projects in the N.O. At first, it was more of a battle of the hoods of music that represented who was more thorough in dance, style, and fashion. Peep pop was huge in New Orleans. Baby was already known in the city for his hustling abilities, as well as his stepbrother, Eldrick Wise, got a reputation in the city before he was deleted. Slim is more of the brains behind the scene, which prefers to let Baby occupy the spotlight. It will be Baby's idea to push gangsta boss music onto the national scene, believing they could capitalize on the sound. After P of New Limit Records was already making money with his version of New Orleans hip hop. When Baby was released from prison, he and Slim would survey the local hip hop scene. He and Slim would study what was going on and how Master P capitalized on what he was doing. In 1992, they would press forward and start their own record label, Cash Money Records. Baby and Slim would hit up hoods all over the N.O. find artists to sign. Before the internet and SoundCloud, getting new hip-hop artists recognized on the music scene would require a lot of labor. It also took tens and thousands of dollars to make and market records that could be distributed to DJs and record stores. Baby never wanted to shy away from stunting or make claims before the age of 20. He had already had a million dollars in the streets. This was spawn rumors that Cash Money Records was launched with street money, which throughout its long history led the feds to always be sniffing around looking to topple the empire targeting another set of black men who had came up from the streets. Three teams from the main streets of New Orleans will form the group, UNLV. UNLV was signed to Cash Money Records as one of their first acts. Once Cash Money got the distribution deal, it would have the opportunity to make an impact on the national music scene. Baby and Slim would initially be excited about UNL's deep potential, signing them to a deal because of their raw talent. Manny Fresh will be once noted in saying that UNLV were the essence of New Orleans hip-hop. UNLV's most popular song was called 
drag him in the river. A diss aimed at Mystical, another well-known rapper from New Orleans. The beat will later be used for a juvenile track titled Set It Off. Yellow Boy was a member of the Uptown New Orleans group during LV. The group will be made up of Tech 9 Le Ya, and Yella. A lot of rappers from the NO will be influenced by the gritty, grimy street music that UNLV had introduced to the game. Yella, a standout member of the group UNLV, was a live wire that was very vocal. It was known throughout the city that Yellow had several run-ins with Baby behind his money. In 1997, Yellow would lose his life during an alleged deal going wrong. One thing worth mentioning about the passing of Yellow Boy was the timing. The passing of Yellow would come after two very high-profile rap cases. Tupac passed a year prior to Biggie being deleted a month before Yellow. It wouldn't be long before CMO would discover a young Fina, born Dwayne Michael Carter Jr. and raised in the infamous New Orleans neighborhood of Holly Grove. Dwayne was a straight-A student but never felt his true intelligence was expressed through any kind of report card. Wayne would find that music was the best way to express himself and after taking the name Gangsta D, he began writing rhymes. Combining a strong work ethic with aggressive self-promotion, the 11-year-old was taken on by CMO. A year later, in-house producer Manny Fresh will partner Wayne with Christopher Dorsey, aka BG, dubbing the duo the BGs. The same year, Wayne would officially run with the moniker Lil Wayne, dropping the D from his first name in order to separate himself from an absent father. Later, forming the Hot Boys with Juvie, BG, and Turk, CMR was signed a distribution deal with the major label Unil. Universal Records. The other acts will soon leave the label. Wayne would go on to become a global superstar. By 2016, Wayne had become embroiled in a legal battle with Birdman and Cash Money Records. In 2015, Jimmy Carlton Winfrey, aka P.B. Roscoe, a young thug and Birdman affiliate, would be arrested for allegedly hitting up Wayne's tour bus while the vehicle was parked outside of a concert venue in Atlanta. Winfrey would be originally indicted on 27 charges, including violation of the RICO Act, multiple counts of aggravated assault, and criminal damage damage to property. Winfrey would be sentenced to 10 years in prison after taking a plea deal in the case. That sentence would ultimately be thrown out in 2018 after it was found the presiding judge reportedly dangled a harsher sentence over his head if he hadn't taken the plea deal. Court documents confirmed that Winfrey received a new seven-year sentence as a result of his plea deal. The original indictment against Winfrey asserted that Young Thug and Birdman were conspirators in the attack against Wayne's tour bus. Ryan Baby Williams will be on a recorded phone call discussing the incident with Pee Wee. Birdman would never be charged. But now we're about to witness the strength of street knowledge. For the New Jack City. Bum. A New Orleans rapper, Bond, Desmond Jerome, supported and promoted while he was incarcerated by GDP. An up-and-coming figure on the New Orleans music scene was deleted in the Holly Grove neighborhood of the N.O. E.T.Y. Youngin, who had signed a deal with Cash Money Records in 2016, was crushed outside of the gas station on April 29th of 2017. There were rumors that there was no mention of Youngin for days, maybe even weeks, after his passing by CMR. This is part two of Blood Money Records. On December 12, 1989, to Gabriel Jerome and Robert Smith, Desmond would begin rapping at the age of 14. In his adolescent years, Desmond would attend Riverdale High in Jefferson Parish. Mr. Mina, a legend from New Orleans hip-hop scene, would attend high school with Desmond's mom. Watching Desmond grow up in his character neighborhood, Mina would call Desmond Lil D, short for Desmond. This would be well before Desmond would go by the moniker B.T.Y. Youngin. Mina, who would hear Desmond spit at a party being drunk, would instantly recognize his talent. Determined to help the young Desmond escape the grimy streets of the N.O., at the age of 18, Mina and Slim would take Desmond under their wing and mentor him. Later, introducing Desmond to Juvie, who would feature Desmond on his cocky and confident album, that of which he would earn four grand for two verses. Court records would show that Desmond would have arrests in Orleans and Jefferson parishes dating back to 2007. Those charges would range from selling at hard to an undercover cop with possession of straps, including a second degree charge that would be played down to a lesser offense. At the age of 16, Desmond would be hit up. Desmond in interviews would admit to wigging off them things while in a rap battle and pulling out his tool. In the street of the N.O., never pull it if you don't intend on using it. Pulling the blicky would ultimately lead to Desmond being hit 
up despite his buzz on the music scene Desmond would still be in the streets in 2008 Desmond would plead guilty to possession of Jefferson Parish and receive two years of probation the 2011 charge would garner Desmond a five year bid which he would be released early on for good behavior Desmond would attribute his criminal history to being in the streets trying to earn a living after dropping out of high school it will be those life experiences that Desmond will put into his lyrics out to fulfill the promise he made to himself upon the release Desmond will focus on his rap career. It will be this dedication that will garner the attention of music execs. In 2016, Youngin would win Breakthrough Artist of the Year at the 2016 NOLA Music Awards. Grinding hard, Youngin would drop several music videos and mixtapes, such as the 2016 mixtape I Ain't Sorry for the Wait, a play on a mixtape series that was released by Lil Wayne of Cash Money Records. BTY Youngin was on his way up, linking up with Brian Baby Williams, aka Birdman, to ink a deal with Cash money records. Her man will go on to cameo in several of Youngin's videos. The envy and jealousy will begin to pour in via social media outlets. Youngin will be advised to block all users leaving negative comments. This would only intensify the jealousy. Youngin, who was still living in the hood after gaining acclaim and notoriety in the music industry, will be engulfed in what came with the street life. The at the time 27 year old BTY Youngin would be on the rise amid a troubled life. He had been in and out of court and jail over the years, but record labels were still calling. Youngin would get back to the community by participating in reality check where he would speak to the youth about his troubled past. Part of growing up in the hoods that Youngin rapped about would also mean brushes with the law. Youngin, who had converted to Islam, would have an entirely new drive and outlook on life. Growing up in not the best of conditions, Youngin will reminisce about the good time that he did have coming up as a child, like getting fresh outfits for every holiday. One thing about Youngin, he wasn't selfish. He had always been willing to give back to his people. Desmond Jerome Sr., the artist known and loved by fans as BTY Youngin, would pass Saturday, April 29th of 2017 at the age of 27. Desmond would be shot at 11.15 p.m. on a Saturday night at a gas station in the 9200 block of Airline Highway. Well, a man who was picked as NOLA Music's Breakout Artist of the Year is today being remembered as an up-and-coming rap artist who was devoted to his two-month-old son. Desmond Jerome last night as he went to secure a deal for an upcoming concert. His given name was Desmond Jerome, but as rapper BTY Young and friends say, he was on the verge of big things. I never was a materialistic individual. Once he started making money off of music, you know, that's all his focus was on. Michael Patterson was a mentor and friend and was shocked to learn Jerome was at 1115 Saturday night at this gas station in the 9200 block of Airline Highway. In the streets, sometimes when people are trying to you know, get themselves in a better position, you know, some people don't like to see that. Our partners at NOLA.com, the Times-Picayune report, Jerome had a history of arrests, including an attempted second degree four years ago. We did it as much as we could do to protect him from being out here in the streets. But his friends say with a two-month-old boy and a promising career, the 27-year-old was turning things around. I remember going to the house one day and he just showed me a box of money he's saving for his kid. He was building a future and everybody around him knew it. In fact, six months ago, Jerome was named Breakthrough Artist of the Year at the NOLA Music Awards. He was being looked at by several major labels, um, including Cash Money. They say Jerome would use his newfound fame to try and help others. And I use Youngin as a guy to kind of tell people that he had been through some tough things and he was getting past that. New Year's Eve this year, he shut down Sector 6 and paid for all the kids in there. Friends say Jerome was picking up a check last night for an upcoming concert and was then heading to the studio when an assailant struck him down. Some of his colleagues were there recording and um, it was just a really grim call. It wasn't what we expected. He was, he, he was a blessed kid, like, you know, he just, he just got eliminated before he got his shot to show the world what he can actually do. In the end, friends say Jerome couldn't escape the city's mean streets and those who envied his success. I always was concerned about that, um, but it seemed like he was on the upper end of it now. It was, you know, it was just messed up that this happened. They have not released any information on a possible suspect. You know, just to see 
a young guy that, you know, I had big plans for that, that I thought was about to make a big difference in his life and in his family's life to be laying down and it was like, I was just numb. Michael Patterson is numb after finding out about BTY Young or Desmond Jerome. He's known Jerome before he was even a rapper and Patterson says from an early age, Jerome had it. So he started rapping for me, I was like, oh, he raw. He just was raw talent. He just was in him, he rapping nonstop, like, I mean, balls after balls. Patterson says Jerome was able to paint vivid portraits of life with lyrics. We had a, a, a thing called Reality Check that we was a part of, and I used to bring Youngin out to go speak to kids, you know what I'm saying? He'd tell the kids about how he got five times. While Patterson says Jerome had a tough life growing up, he says about two years ago, Jerome converted to Islam and had a new drive. I was like, you about to get out of here, you know, especially when the cash money uh, offer came on the table and things of that sort. I was like, young and this is shot, this this, this the opportunity. That rise was clipped short last night when Jerome near this gas station on Airline Highway. I think some people just get kind of jealous that they see that somebody's about to actually, you know, make it. Patterson thinks Jerome was targeted while he's waiting to secure a deposit for a future performance came to get a deposit for a show and, and then all of a sudden some guys just roll up on him. I'm quite sure they knew that they was coming to, you know, do what they did toward him, you know. As the details emerge, fans and friends like Patterson's daughter, Amari, says the community will truly miss an artist like BTY Youngin. One thing about him, he wasn't like, you know, selfish. He wasn't one of those people like, I'm coming up, I'm gonna forget the people. He was willing to like give back to his people in New Orleans. In Terrytown, Jacqueline Quinn, Eyewitness News. And Jerome, also known as BTY Youngin, had just welcomed a baby girl this year. The 39ers are a street crew comprised of dudes from the Upper Ninth Ward, G Strip, Gallier Street, and 3NG, a notorious Central City crew named for its stronghold around the 3rd and Galvis area. Several of the alleged members would also hail from the Florida housing projects. The crews would combine forces to press for control of the dog food trade, often through smashing their ops. Those ops would be ride or die from the 8th Ward, as well as dudes out the Yo and the D. The crew would be held accountable for the double crushing that took place in 2010 in the New Orleans East. This is the story of Magnolia Shardy and Jerome Man Man Hampton. Renata Lowe, a.k.a. Magnolia Shorty, was born September 30th, 1982, in New Orleans, Louisiana, to Brenda Lowe and Raymond Fletcher. Shorty's pop was a music entertainer who performed gigs locally in the city. Raised in the Magnolia Projects by her mom, Shorty would be involved with church as an adolescent. Shorty, who also had a love for music, would start penning lyrics in her personal notebook. Upon realizing Shorty's love for music, her mom would purchase Renetta her first tape recorder. Although Shorty's mom would support her love for music, she was against the profanity in Shorty's lyrics. Shorty would rock DJs, block parties, as well as hold in the wall bars in the city. It is rumored that Slim gave Renetta the name Magnolia Shorty. It wouldn't be long before her song, Monkey on That D, would grab the attention of Cash Money Records. Shorty would later sign with the label, re-releasing and distributing Monkey on the D professionally under the Cash Money Records imprint. Jerome Man Man Hampton was born February 12, 1982 to Laura Davis and Jerome Tapp. Raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, Jerome would run the streets at an early age. In 2006, the HPD would question Hurricane Katrina evacuees that moved to Texas in light of the storm. This would be an attempt at locating five men accused of various crimes, including a man suspected in a revenge crushing related to the passing of James Tapp, a.k.a. Soldier Slim. The fifth man would be Jerome Hampton, a.k.a. Man Man. Man Man would be taken into custody on Sunday, March 12th, after allegedly busting at New Orleans police officers that were trying to apprehend him. On Monday, December 20th, 2010, shortly before 12.30 p.m., Renetta, while riding in her white Chevy Malibu with Jerome Hampton, a.k.a. Man Man, was getting ready to travel to Miami to perform at a bounce-style festival, but needed to stop at her apartment first to pick up a few items. As Shardy and Man Man were leaving out the apartment, they would slow down by the speed bumps. Unbeknownst to them, 
five men inside a white Ford Crown Victoria will be waiting for them. One of the men will jump out of the whip and start busing, calls Renetta, who is driving to crash into a fence located in the 6300 block of Bridge Hampton Drive in the New Orleans East. The other four occupants will jump out of the whip and start letting off at Renetta's car. One of the men will stand on top of the vehicle, letting off directly through the sunroof to ensure everyone inside was crushed. The men would then flee the scene. The NOPD would arrive, finding both Renetta and Jerome had been hit multiple times. Both would be pronounced deleted at the scene. Shorty had been hit up over 25 times. Due to the extremeness of the case, the NOPD mag unit would be brought in to take over. The streets were buzzing. Green G had been rumored to be trying to get Man Man for a long time. She had finally caught up with him. It wouldn't be until August of 2014 that the grand jury would indict all four suspects from the 39ers in the deletion of Renetta Lowe and Jerome Hampton. Gregory Rabbit Stewart, another member of the 39ers, will become one of the FBI's most important confidential informants. He would also take to the witness stand to help send as many of his homies to the penitentiary as possible. Gregory Rabbit Stewart will testify on the witness stand how he, McCoy Red Walker, Harry T. Red Oni, Tyrone T-Bone Knockham hit up the car, crushing Renetta and Jerome. On February the 2nd of 2017, a jury will find 10 men accused of being members of the 39ers guilty for all offenses. Seven of the men will be convicted of conspiracy to use weapons to further trafficking and violent crimes. McCoy, Rat Walker, and Terry T. Redoni, two of the defendants were found guilty of crushings. Seven years after the crushings, Rat and T. Red will be given life sentences by a U.S. District Judge. The sealed records that were not made visible to the public would show as such. Around Nakam being guilty in June, contingent on federal prosecutors not pursuing the penalty against him for the question of Shorty and Man Man. Tyrone Nakam admitted driving the white Ford Crown Victoria. For others, Stewart, Jackson, Terry T. Red Oni, and McCoy Rat Walker on the hunt for Man Man, according to the charging document underpinning his guilty plea. Ebon and Freaky admitted the group was from a man who was a member of their rival's crew that had a well-earned reputation for crushing. All five men would give written and verbal statements that the 39ers were spooking that man was going to knock off Merle O'Fray. The fear of Merle O'Fray being crushed would ultimately be the reason they would conspire to smash my man. T-Bone, who was the driver for the deletion of my man and Shardy, admitted that he was a member of VNG and an associate of the 39ers that participated in a conspiracy to pump that hard in 11-5. He would also freely admit that he aided and abetted the other four and looking for a deleting Renetta Lowe and Jerome Hampton. T-Bone also agreed to plead guilty to state charges against him in exchange for a 20-year sentence to be served in federal prison. Freaky, who pleaded guilty in October, would admit to being armed with an SKS during the crushings. Freaky also admitted that he participated in the smashing of Jerome Hampton and his associates in an effort to protect their turf and to retaliate against a rival for the purpose of maintaining and increasing his position with his own group. Freaky would claim that my man had threatened to crush him and all of the 39ers, further going on to say that Charlie was not the target of this crime but happened to get smashed as she was in the car with my man. All five men would give written and verbal statements that the crushing of Stephen Kennedy was in retaliation for the crushing of James Tapp, aka Soldier Slim. This would prompt the feds to tag the man and Ivory Brandon B. Stupid Harris, who admitted to the 2016 deletion of Jerome and Wise on Fat Tuesday as partners. Before the given statements, the feds would not know the connection between them. Deletions. The NOPD suspected that man of being the getaway driver in the crushing of wives. These false made up charges with no evidence to support him would be later dropped. And man was also charged in Texas for the crushing that the five men would tell the feds was in retaliation for Slim. Freaky is facing a mandatory life sentence, which he will serve behind federal bars as part of his plea deal. Freaky will plead guilty to the racketeering charges and the indictment, as well as two counts of crushing and aid of racketeering. Washington Big Walsh McCaskill pleaded guilty in February. His guilty plea is also contingent on prosecutors declining the penalty on him in relation to the separate crushings of Floyd Moore and Michael Marshall in 2011. As part of this deal, Walsh agreed to plead guilty to the state court to three manslaughter counts for the smashing of Lester Foster, 
Charles Anderson, a.k.a. Buck, and Lester Allen, a.k.a. Fat Man, with an 80-year sentence attached. Bosch would enter his guilty pleas in March. T. Red would file a motion to sever his trial from the 39ers based on proven false testimony previously provided by Gregory Rapid Stewart. Jasmine Perry would file a motion to vacate several counts of the conspiracy based on proven false testimony previously provided by Gregory Rapid Stewart. Counts 3, 5, 7, 15, 16, 17, 19, 23, 25, 30, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, and 46 could all be vacated. Contrary to popular belief, Gregory Robert Stewart, the highest profile witness on the case due to his involvement in so many crushings, would not be the first to cooperate. Darrell Breezy Franklin would actually be the first to cooperate with the government. Breezy would give the government all of the crushings that Rabbit had been a part of. It was only then that Rabbit would turn over involving the other members of his crew. The actual confirmed sentences of Darrell Breezy Franklin and Gregory Rapper Stewart still remain sealed. In 1937, New Orleans would become the first city in the United States to benefit under the Wagner Act. Florida Avenue Development was the fourth of six low-rent public housing developments in New Orleans that were funded by the Wagner Bill. Under the provisions of the contract signed with the United States Housing Authority, the Florida Avenue Development was to be used exclusively for white veterans of World War II and was to revert to the local housing authority after the conflict was over. Built in 1946, the Florida would be constructed on 18.5 acres of land bounded by Florida Avenue and North Durgeon Wall. Maison and Gallagher Streets in the Upper Ninth Ward, resembling most public housing complexes with 47 two and three story brick buildings for a total of 734 units housing 1,297 residents. The Florida apartments will be arranged around courtyards that were largely isolated from the rest of the community. Originally built for whites, the Florida would be desegregated by the 1970s, becoming a predominantly black project. In the mid 90s, Florida and nearby Desire Projects was dubbed as the most troubled housing projects in the nation. In 1994, the Florida will record the highest deletion rate out of all handled developments with 26 crushing, surpassing the 13 smashings in the Desire, which previously held the highest record a year before. Majority of the Florida crushings in 94 were fueled by turf feuds. The deletion spike in the Florida and the Desire contributed to the city becoming the crushing capital of America. That year, the city's deletion rate would reach 424 crushings, 47 of those smashings would occur in Hano developments. In 2013, Housing Authority of New Orleans Administrative Receiver David Gilmore would announce at a Hano's board meeting being held February 19th that the Housing Authority had been awarded a construction contract to Park Crest Builders for 51 new units where Florida once stood. The $13.1 million project will be funded with $8.3 million in FEMA dollars and four point eight million in capital funding due to a federal probe. After more than four years working to overhaul the Housing Authority of New Orleans, David Gilmore will step down as the federal government's overseer of the agency, clearing the way for the once troubled agency to return to local control. The year is 1994. The date is June 2nd. Rodney Temple will be indicted. Rodney will enter a plea of not guilty at his arraignment on June 30th of 1994. August 26th of 1994, Rodney will file discovery and suppression motions. A suppression hearing will be held on June 30th, 1995. The trial court will deny Rodney's motions to suppress statements and evidence. Rodney will be found guilty and charged after a jury trial on April 22nd of 1996. May 6th of 1996, Rodney will be sentenced to life imprisonment at our labor without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. This is the story of Edgar Gibbons, a.k.a. Pimp Daddy. Edgar Gibbons, better known to the city as Pimp Daddy, would be a pioneer in bringing New Orleans bounce music to the world. His smash hit, Got To Be Real, on Full Pack Records, would have clubs and bars rocking. Pimp, who didn't have a whip at the time, would show up to local bars in the hood and rock the mic. Pimp's harmonizing style was unique and original. Dwayne Carter, a.k.a. Lil Wayne, would idolize Pimp as a kid, initially going by the name Shrimp Daddy. In 1994, Pimp would release his debut album with up-and-coming record label at the time, 
Cash Money Records. Pimp, however, would not get to enjoy the success of his debut album. His life would be taken in 1994. It's 5.30 a.m. the morning of April 18, 1984. NOPD officer Lynn Major and his partner Mark Delpit are responding to a battery call at 3620 Florida Avenue. Upon reaching the third floor of the building, the officers would observe the front door partially open. Not knowing what was on the other side and hesitant to barge in, the officers would peep inside the apartment and see an identified man in an upright position on the sofa with his arm folded and head back. Upon getting a closer look, the officers would realize that the unidentified man had been crushed. The man would be later identified as 18-year-old Edgar Gibbons of New Orleans, aka Pimp Daddy. The NOPD would speak with Nakwesha Gray and Quincy Temple, the uncle of the apartment owner, Kim Temple. Quincy would testify that he and his girlfriend, Nakisha Gray, went to the house of Kim on Monday with Rodney Temple. They would arrive at approximately 9 p.m., all planning to spend the night. Later that night, they would all eat pizza and go to sleep. Quincy and Nakwesha would sleep in a bedroom. Rodney would sleep on the living room sofa. Awakened by shots, Quincy and Nakisha would run to the living room. They would find Edgar on the sofa. He had been crushed. Rodney would be nowhere in sight. Quincy and Aquisha would run to Quincy's mother's house and call the NOPD. Quincy, Aquisha, and Rodney would all return to Kim's apartment and give statements to the NOPD. Rodney's mother would arrive on the scene later that morning. Kim Temple would testify that she resided at 3620 Florida Avenue. Edgar, who she would identify as her ex boyfriend had lived there with her at some point. At the time, Edgar was deleted. Kim would tell the NOPD that she was living with her mother, alleging that she and Edgar had gotten into an argument and broke up. Kim would tell the NOPD that Edgar would always put hands on her. Kim would go on to say that the day before Edgar was deleted, he would take her keys to the apartment and ram Shad the apartment. Upon receiving Rodney Temple's statement, he would be placed in the back of the police car. Rodney would confess to smashing Edgar, going on to say that he hit Edgar up five times and left the scene to stash the blicky. Rodney would show the NOPD where he stashed the toolie. The NOPD would retrieve the gat from under the porch at 3613 North Wall Street. Rodney would be taken to NOPD headquarters where he would refuse to make any further statements. Rodney's mom, Helen Temple, would testify that on the morning of April 19, 1994, the NOPD would arrive to her home and ask her to go with them. Upon arriving on the scene, Rodney would already be in the back of the police car. It was then that the NOPD would inform her that Rodney had deleted Edgar. Miss Helen and Rodney would both be taken to headquarters where Rodney would confess to his mom that he smashed Edgar. Miss Helen would go on to say that she had no knowledge of Rodney having a history of violence, but she did, however, know that he was always strapped. Rodney would testify that Pimp, who was dating his cousin Kim, would always put hands on her. It is alleged that the day before Rodney would delete Pimp, Kim had called the NOPD to report that Pimp had broken into her apartment and destroyed the apartment. It is alleged that Rodney would help Kim clean up the apartment. On the evening of April 18, 1984, Rodney, Quincy, and Akisha would go to Kim's apartment. Rodney would allege that during the night, he would sense someone standing over him, which would awaken him. Upon looking up, he would realize that Pimp was standing over him. Rodney would go on to say that a scuffle would ensue, alleging that Pimp would grab him and sling him off the sofa, grabbing him by his neck. Rodney, who would stash his strap under the sofa, would reach and grab it. They would struggle over the blicky. Rodney would wrestle Pimp down to the sofa, grab his blicky, and delete Pimp. Rodney would flee the scene and wouldn't return until the next day, after the NOPD had been called. On June 2nd, 1994, Rodney Temple would be indicted for second degree. Rodney would be found guilty and charged after a jury trial on April 22nd, 1996. May 6th of 1996, Rodney would be sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. This was the story of Edgar Gibbons, AKA Pimp Daddy. <laughs>